are listening to Aim Higher, a Catholic podcast designed to instruct and to encourage the daily practice of our faith. Fox at Bonum, peace and good to you all. This is Aim Higher. I am Father Anthony, and with me is Sister Catherine. And, well, no, we've done another episode. I was going to say it's been a while. But it hasn't been really been a while. No, uh, but uh, today, today's uh, episode, we're going to be uh, talking about the life and times of Father Bernard Calusi OFM, who passed away last month on the 24th of July. And uh, we have a uh, tribute video on our YouTube channel uh, for him. Really well done. Uh, it was to my sister. Really well done. Uh, and uh, we thought it would be appropriate for us to kind of just go over a little bit of Father Bernard, um, his life. And it's really from the point that we knew him. Uh, you know, Father Joseph, had, uh, we had this funeral in Kentucky. We had two funerals. We had one in Wabaka at Our Lady of the Rosary with the, the wake and the funeral itself, which we have pictures of. I really probably some nice pictures. I would actually wouldn't mind putting those online because they were nice uh, of, of him uh, on, I'm about to say on display, <laughs> but uh, for, for, the, for the wake, uh, for the viewing, he was set for being viewed. Uh, but I also, hmm, I, I, my headset's being funny. Um, but also, uh, that was for the people there in Wisconsin. And so then we also had his burial, a funeral mass before, and his burial in Kentucky, for that is where he is buried um, in, at St. Joseph's Mission in Union, Kentucky, uh, along with uh, Bishop Lewis and Brother Dominic, by that matter. And so, uh, uh, yeah, so in Father Joseph, uh, he was the celebrant, and he gave a beautiful sermon, and, he, and also he wrote a little bit, you'll see in the next issue of The Seraph, a little bit on Father Bernard's life, um, touching on things, some things that I didn't, I didn't even know about, uh, and uh, really from his perspective for Father Bernard and what we have learned from him. And uh, but I was kind of sharing like our experiences with Father because we've known Father like our whole lives. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, I, I have mentioned to you, I, I, you may, I don't. I don't recall a time not knowing Father Bernard. Yeah. I mean, when he came to take over as pastor of Early of the Rosary, that was early 1987. So, Father, mm -hmm. you would have been just two years two old. And a half. Yeah. Two and not, not even two and a half. No, not even two and a half. So, um, I was five and don't quite really remember too much differently but i know i had to have probably that fall went into the school mm -hmm. so and i mean i remember the school as far as well sister antonia was my teacher and father bernard was james's teacher because at that very mm -hmm. first year it was just james and i mm -hmm. and i was actually i was in kindergarten at the local public school i wasn't there very long and mm -hmm. mom and dad decided to put me in at our lady of the rosary um, which was really good for me, but it probably spoiled me a little bit in the sense that I had that nice one-on-one -on -one learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, did. I was like, that was probably my best year of consistent marks of good grades, if you will. So, I mean, yeah. I learned how to spell incomprehensible and Magnolia because we used to go on walks. I mean, mm -hmm. anyone who's been when we were in Milwaukee probably remembers the area around it. And there's some, it was a nice uh, street, some nice houses, but mm -hmm. there's a house just not far that had a beautiful magnolia tree. So mm -hmm. um, lots of fond memories to look back yeah, on. For sure. I remember, I remember the, uh, the walks around the church in on 52nd Elizabeth. We say church. 
Yeah. It was a converted warehouse. Mm-hmm. It, it, well, it was actually, well, it can't just say warehouse because I think people just think an big open space building, but um, actually uh, you had a storefront mm-hmm. and you had an upstairs apartment and then further in the back, which was the, the bulk of the building. Uh, was where you had all that uh, warehouse storage space. Um, and that's where we would have uh, the upstairs of that area was uh, became the church proper. And the downstairs became uh, the, the school con- and, a, and a, a place of room for us, uh, the parishioners to congregate after mass. Uh, so it was it was actually very convenient in that way. It had a lot of space. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, which we've sacrificed a bit uh, coming up to Wabaka, but I yeah. think it was worth it. It was probably more centralized, mm-hmm. generally speaking. I mean, I know for some people it's still a distance. You know, our mm-hmm. grandparents didn't live very close, but um, once you get on the expressway, it's not so bad. And that's yeah. kind of like where for a lot of people, even with going up to Wabaka, if you don't live too far from the 43. Mm-hmm. And when you think about it, it's just part of the, part of the sacrifice and our love for God. So, yeah. um, and the thing is where we were in Milwaukee over the years, the area was really yeah. exciting. Oh, you got to be careful about where you parked. I've had my license plate stolen on my car. And mm-hmm. I think, I think mom and dad had it done twice. So yeah, yeah, you, you had you know, to, uh, <laughs> You had to be smart about it, and I know that when we would have all night vigils there, um, Father Bernard, especially when it was women, he would make sure they got to their cars. Yeah. Um. Even I think I think even kind of to start discouraging some like older ladies to come in the middle of the night, mm-hmm. uh, going to us younger younger men. Uh, but. It, it, it was uh, it's just a sad thing to have seen that area decline, and it's it's kind of a thing you see in a lot of cities, uh, areas that were once really nice, just crime, and a lot of crime started happening around there. But put that aside, mm-hmm. it was actually a very convenient building, and you know we had plenty of room for a school, and uh, I and that was. That was great. Um, of course, with Father Bernard, you know, uh, when he arrived, uh, they were still doing remodeling in that building. Uh, actually, you know what? Come to think of it, they, I think they, I think they had the building. Yeah, they had the building before Father arrived. Mm-hmm. So yeah, but there's a picture we have, and it's it's on the uh, the tribute of him and Sister Antonina, uh, in that front room. Yeah, in that front room is taking it was a uh, taken from a newspaper article written about about this uh, old timey Catholic uh, group saying the Latin Mass. There was a video, you know, something uh, uh, it's worth mentioning, I guess. Uh, when Father Bernard came, and not too long after he came, I think maybe, uh, well, if it had been almost right away, Sister, because like you said, it was like in that fall of '87, you came for you came for school. Well, mm-hmm. but it had been just you and James then, because I know mm-hmm. when they the, the 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 news crew came in mm-hmm. and they started. Well, yeah, you were there. Were you? Well. See, that probably was still the spring of yeah. that year. I wouldn't have been there. That was probably when it was just James. Because James was already part of the school. So there's like a back history that we're not going to okay. get into. But um, Father Burner basically took over what was already in place. And then yeah. um, groups split. And James was really the only um, school-age child at that uh, time. Yeah. Part of the group that was still there. Because I'm pretty sure I did not. I would have gone there in the fall. Okay. Yeah. I just don't remember when this, uh, this video was taken. I, I, you kind of wonder 
if you can find it somewhere online, archived. I know we had a VHS. Yeah, our brother uh, has a VHS. I think, wasn't it like Channel 12 in Milwaukee? W- WISN. Um, gosh, who was the... Was it Jerry Taff? We- no, well, that was when Jerry Taft was around, but I think it was Kathy Michael B. that might have interviewed him. Oh my gosh! I mean, yeah, you, I have, know. you have to be you have to be from Wisconsin to appreciate. Well, and, and what we're staying here yeah. in Milwaukee. There's probably, yeah, there's probably a couple of people that listen like, oh, I remember that. Maybe it, I mean, I don't know. I know our brother has that tape, and I thought he was going to try to digitize it. I don't know what happened. Um, maybe we well, can... you know, you mentioned that to me. I, 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 I'll be seeing him this weekend, so I can talk go. to him about it. I, th- uh, I think the last he told me the file's really big, so it might just be a matter okay. of trying to figure that out. But that would be cool to share because yeah. I don't. Yeah, uh, that would be cool to share. Well, I, it's also, it... what's on that tape is our first midnight mass Christmas. So, um, <laughs> and and uh, are doing our little procession. Oh, boy. And I'm, I'm dressed up like an angel father who uh, is just three years old. He has a little bit of a meltdown because his candle gets blown out. So, I mean, that, hey, was, that was a traumatic experience for this young boy. Well, uh, and it was also right before midnight. So, um, yeah, I was probably a little cranky. I was probably a little cranky around, but it was just the candle was supposed to be lit and it wasn't. And, you know, it's first, just. I mean, Think about it. How many people would let their three-year-old hold a candle? I mean, probably some of our mom listeners are like, um, <laughs> mom and dad. Maybe God blew that candle out or your guardian angel because this. It, maybe I would have burned burn the church down. Because, because we had the 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 nativity scene in the back. Yeah. And I think there was like a lot of like things to, for fake snow. So probably some probably very flammable material so you know maybe your guardian angel blew out that candle because we just use some of that extra asbestos and then we just make snow. Right. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I don't think know if there was asbestos in that building i'm just uh it's just a very interesting so maybe we can get that information yeah, that would be neat that would be neat and I just remember when we were kids, we called it the James show because our brother was on it, Mm -hmm. a little kid, Uh, and uh, he would have been about almost nine. Almost nine. Yeah, Yeah, almost nine. And uh, and there's Father Bernard on it, and they actually had an interview with him. In studio. In studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, they touched a little bit about our position, and I know he didn't, if I recall, it wasn't getting in too much you only have so much time uh-huh. basically you just state the simple position that we have and you leave it there i would love to find that but i, I guess i know i guess that's a pretty good uh starting point for us because it gives an idea over the building where we were we only live 10 minutes away uh-huh. and so but there's a lot of activity uh, a lot of the people who just came you know from the nova sordo you know finding the latin mass Coming here, uh, you people who, who were in their 40s and 50s, you know, like our grandparents were in their 50s at this time, and you know they had a lot more energy, and they, they our, our family was really active in the church. So you know, it wasn't long after Father Bernard came, when Bishop Lewis placed him there, that he became the choir director. Uh, oh, it was yeah. like right away, and I I, mean, I, yeah. I remember. I had uh, dad. Did I say dad? No, it kind of the way you worded almost as if Father Bernard became the choir director. Oh, so. I'm sorry. Our dad <laughs> became the choir director. And I remember he and I have talked about this a few times. And he mentioned to me that basically Father Bernard arrived uh, Palm, mm-hmm. around Palm Sunday uh-huh. of that year and uh-huh. said to dad, I want a high mass on Easter Sunday. And I was like, uh, okay, which began his odyssey. <laughs> as a choir choir director mm-hmm. and he still is th- to this day and i think he knows a thing or two by now <laughs> probably uh but so i don't know how long how how many years after but like i say my first really real clear memory of father bernard was probably one of those nights that we were coming for uh, choir practice. And sometimes I don't know if it was all the time it was on a Tuesday sometimes. So we would also take part in Tuesday night vigil, which I think was the St. Anthony, uh, novena. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just remember pulling up with dad, getting out of the car, and there's Father Bernard walking down the uh, sidewalk in front of the building. And I just pop out and just go, Father Bernard. And I run up to him and I hug him. And he, you know, hugs me, picks me up, and he's like, how are you doing? And that's like how Father Bernard would do it. How are you doing? Mm-hmm. And I felt really bad later on in years that I got to know him, especially working together as, you know, a uh, brother and priest. And pre- uh, he meet a dog. He'd say it the same way. How are you doing? I say, so that basically um, uh, he thought of me no more than a dog. <laughs> Yeah, I'm supposed to have looked at it that oh, way. Oh, no, no. But, I know, but, but. You know, well, maybe I'll, we'll put it this way. There's an innocence to a little child as there is to a dog. At least I hope there's innocence to this child that we're speaking of. Uh, but it's like, how are you doing? And it was just, just, it was like his excited way of showing affection. Mm-hmm. And that's like my first memory. And basically, I don't remember not knowing Father Bernard. It was just, he's always been there. Mm-hmm. I don't recall, oh. I've met this priest. I I can tell you, like the first time I saw Father Joseph, I okay. First time Father Joseph came out uh, after his ordination. Father Joseph was ordained in, uh, in June of eighty seven, so just a few months after Father Bernard was sent there, uh, and in Milwaukee. Yeah, I don't remember. And it. then. Now, I don't remember. I don't remember it either. Uh, I was told I was there. I was told I was present. But um, Father Joseph, for my knowledge, he didn't come back to Milwaukee until like uh, the spring of like 92 or or was somewhere in 91 because Father Bernard had a um, kidney stone issue and it's it's an issue that he's had, you know, is as far as I know, his entire adult life, or at least up to that point or beginning at that point. And he, uh, so father Bernard, which is, is, you don't normally see this father Bernard was one where he just worked his way through it. I mean, whatever it was, whatever illness, whatever sickness, he worked his way through it to get the people mass, to hear confessions. But if you ever had a kidney stone, it, it, I've never had it. And I've, I, but I've been heard. described it's painful. And, you know, like, like for a man, I've been told it's like the closest you'll get to understanding what a woman goes through well, in child I, I've, labor. I've heard that some women have shared that they'd rather go through labor than mm-hmm. unmedicated labor because some of them have done unmedicated labor mm-hmm. than their kidney stone. So it's painful. And everybody's got different pain tolerance. But I think yeah. that's, like, that's up there, though, is something one of the most painful but, things. But father had a very strong pain tolerance i think Mm -hmm. uh so all i know when you're a kid you don't have grown-ups telling you what's going on maybe mom and dad didn't even know that father bernard went into the hospital went to surgery and then we come to mass and here's this young man tall back then the father joseph just seemed like he was the tallest man in the world and he's naturally not that tall tall. he's regular height uh-huh. Um and younger than Father Bernard, and I was like, okay, who's this fellow? And you know, I see him at the pulpit, and then I see him downstairs. I said that's Father Joseph, and then here he shows up. Not much longer, uh, uh not too long after, uh, he came and and then was there for eight years, helping run the helping in school. So like when it comes to the school in itself, I have more memories of Father Joseph than Father Bernard. Yeah, because Father Bernard was in charge of the high school, and um, you were for our lady the rosary. You were just in primary school. So. Yeah, yeah, and, and both. But I, uh, but there, but there's like a few things about the school and Father Bernard that that just stand out. One, if it was kind of a holiday, you know, some it was kind of one of those. Fun days, if you want to call them. You know, I think for all we know, it could, because I don't know how cognizant we were of the calendar, like the actual church calendar. It mm-hmm. could have been like a feast of St. Francis. Um, yeah, I, I have no know. idea. I have no yeah. idea. You're right. We, we no knew idea. what the holy days were because we didn't have school. Yeah, we didn't have school. As far as regular feast days, but, you know, probably. Yeah. But uh, 
I know that, uh, let me fix this. Uh, uh, we would watch one or two movies. If there was a third one, I don't remember what it was. I'm just trying to think what there are two. Okay. Well, I know what one well, would there, be. There was Song of Bernadette. Yep. Saw it Hands twice down, Father Burner's favorite movie. Yep. I, even in the later years, when we talk about movies, if I were to talk to him as we're driving up to Radisson or something, we talk about a movie, he always goes to Song of Bernadette. And he goes through the scene uh, about when there was like when their uh, vendors were selling stuff at the grotto, and a scene having to do with uh, pulling out, uh, bringing out a sausage, and and like, oh, you're hungry, and Father Bernard. I mean, he'd be laughing as he's telling it. Mm -hmm. So Father Bernard had a good sense of humor. So it'd be that one or um, Joan of Arc. Okay, is that with Ingrid Bergman? Yeah. Yeah, I've always that seen one. that one. See, yeah. it's interesting. And maybe now that I think back, I do remember at least seeing that once in school. But I just remember the song of Bernadette, and it was twice a year. And I will admit, as I got older, I definitely did not appreciate it. I was like, again, our I was kidding done with me. That. Yeah. And it was probably, let's see, 15 years mm -hmm. since I, you know, the time I last saw it to the time I saw it again, it was playing on. Uh, American movie classics uh, New Year's Eve of 2012 it must have been mm -hmm. and I watched it and I was amazed by how much I remembered like the musical <laughs> cues you know yeah. and, and, and I did like that time apart from it plus this was really at the height or like not the height but the beginning of my I really wanted to know love and serve God like take my faith more seriously so I saw it differently and now I will watch it I mean it's been a while but um, you can watch it on YouTube um, yeah, I'll put it on the background if I'm doing a lot of computer work because I can still I can picture it. I know what's going on, so I am grateful that we saw it as much as we did. Um, so if you know if that's inspiration for mm -hmm. parents, you know, was it too much or you know was this a good decision? You know, things have their way of working out. So good movie, good movie. Yeah, I enjoyed it, and uh, so you knew that. You knew that was going to happen. And then when there was ever like a, like a feast or something or, or some kind of party, there was, I mean, ice cream, sheet cake, and a uh, fruit drink. What, yeah. And I, you know, the used term fruit, very, uh, very, uh, very, very, very <laughs> artificial fruit drink. Um, chemical chemical sugar drink, you know, the bright yeah. neon green, orange, purple, yeah, red. Like all those stuff we would get. Gallon right, jugs. You know, in the gallon jugs, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the ice cream, and uh, ice cream, sorry, the milk jugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the same stuff that you would get that looked like it, the little plastic, uh, yeah, the like little a barrel, yeah. like a little barrel, and you would drink the same thing. Or the freezer pops. You know, yeah. that, that big old box of, you know, again, chemical liquid with a lot of sugar. Um, That's what we'd have. And, you know, when I look back on it, I'm like, boy, we eating, we're eating cake and ice cream and washing it down with this stuff. Maybe some of you oh. are, but I, I, oh. I didn't really, I never liked, liked it. I didn't like the combo. Um, yeah. uh. I, and I, there was one year we were planning a Christmas party and I think. They put it in us older girls in charge. And I was like, can we please, please have some cheese and crackers? Because I just can't, I'm not enjoying all the sweets, like, mm -hmm. especially the cake. If there had been more cookies, I might have been more open minded. But I feel like we need a balance. We need to balance out all the sugar. I'm just, I'm Let's not get happy. Let's a fruit tray out here. Let's get a veggie tray out here. Right. Oh, come right. on. Right. You know, let's, so, promote, let's promote health. Uh, right. Yeah. Let, let's ask for, you know, that health book that we've been going through and it shows us all the pictures. Can we live what we're learning? <laughs> let's use it practically. Let's apply what we've been learning. Let's have an apple. Come on, come on, kids. Uh, but you know, that's what Father Bernard would bring. And what well, he was did a lot of stuff with the local bakery, you know, taking, you know, like I think like their day old stuff and oh. and he, he would be you would, you know, you'd come, you'd come to church and, you know, you'd always have it on one of the tables, just all spread out there, a whole bunch of pastry. Well, it even wasn't 
just like the first years, people around the area knew that father had bakeries. So, if it, mm-hmm. you know, they knew that they could come to the door. I mean, one of my mm-hmm. favorite things to do while in school as we got older, I mean, I know it was done years before, but doing the Christmas baskets, mm-hmm. um, you know, every year people would donate food. One of the ladies um, donated canned hams. You know, we take, we would take names and numbers up to a certain point and then we, we would put together the baskets and we mm-hmm. had a list and people would come to the door and it counted as a school day right before Christmas. I mean, it, it was a lot of fun um, to be a part. And the father always had a little extra um, if someone came just in case last minute. So. Yeah, and that practice Father Joseph carried over into down his work in Texas. And I think, I think to this day, he and I have, I've not asked him to this day. I think he still does those baskets. And I was, when I was down in, down in the seminary, you know, those two weeks before Christmas, we're going shopping and putting together the baskets and his father and I, and yeah, it was fun. It was a, it was a lot of work, but it was fun. And, uh, yeah, those are great memories. And it, it, I was really excited when I actually was old enough and make my own money to also make my own donation. Like there was just uh-huh. something excited about feeling that grown up that I could also mm-hmm. do my part that way. So that's why those experiences, I think, are critical. They make an impression because um, I think often people want to know, what do we do for the people? <laughs> you uh-huh. know, are, are, what what what's the charity really like um and well it's it's always interesting when you think of those works of charity because uh, you there are a lot of external things you could do you know you can put together food baskets you can give clear out your cupboard and give someone food but then you think about it well you know what if the stuff's outdated what if the stuff is uh just old or it's not of good quality uh and, and i hear i get I've spoken to people down in Texas, people here, they go to these food pantries and that's what they run into. I, I'm not criticizing because I understand that you you work with what you have and you can only and you're looking to take care of several hundred people. That's probably what you're looking to do. So you can only give them so much. And and some of these baskets, it's like, well, I can I get a thing of pasta, a jar of uh, sauce, uh, and I can get a uh, like a few cans of like peas, and I mean, depending what the what the combination is, and I guess a lot of it depends upon what they get in. Mm-hmm. And there are people that well, that's not enough. I say, well, this is not necessarily going to you know take care of you for a long time, but maybe for a few days. And mm-hmm. it's just kind of understanding, you know, what it is. But at least for me, and this is something Father Joseph impressed upon me you don't give people out-of-date stuff you think that would be like common sense but i've I've seen people um almost look as a way to get rid of their garbage it kind of also you know even with like thrift stores people you'll just take they know it's broken they know it's this but they don't want to dispose of it so they'll just take it to the local thrift store and they have to deal with it and that's not right either it's like Uh, and, you know, you meet people at the thrift store, you know, and they say, well, we're not going to take that. And they can they yeah. can deny a donation. I mean, I, I came in with a, uh, a dresser, and it wasn't a bad dresser. I just didn't need it. And they said, we're not going to take it. It's like, why? Because we're not going to sell this thing. It, yeah, there's it was pretty there's a little bit of damage on it. And I'm like, okay. I, it was a little bit on the top. But anyway, I mean, just like water. No. Uh, well, it was it was very deep set, not a lot of drawers. Um, but, you know, I do think someone that likes to refurbish something could do something with it, but it's just not your standard. It wasn't crafted, but mm-hmm. so yeah. Uh, for some reason, I didn't hear anything you just said. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. I mean, well, I oh, a bunch of this. I could understand you. you like your mic just went out. And it just, it was very, I don't know what it was. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you. I hear you now. Well, all I said was that it was a very unique drawer, very deep set drawers. So yeah. that's. So it's just, you, know, you get rid of it. But it's all about the charity. What works of charity do you do? I, you know, the, the Father Bernard. 
very, one of the most charitable men you ever know. You know, he was one that, it, it, you know, who would help people. If they, you know, called up and they really needed help, he would do whatever he could. Even people coming from off the street. But I also learned from Father Bernard that you have to be shrewd about it, especially if you're located somewhere in the inner city. And this wasn't really the inner city. 52nd of Lisbon wasn't the inner city, but it was really starting to, uh, the inner city was starting to, to, to <laughs> getting uh, close. cross yeah. on over. It's getting close. And um, it's kind of in the outskirts. And uh, I remember having a conversation. I remember Father Burner coming down to Lubbock when I was there. And I remember asking him, what sort of priestly advice can you give me? Just whatever is on top of your head. He said, well, if anybody comes asking for money, be careful. And because there are a lot of people out there who need help, but there's also a lot of people who are just trying to get a fix. <laughs> so Father Bernard told me one story of a man who came and he said, uh, I said, hello, I need some food. I haven't eaten in days. I'm starving. If you can just give me like 20, 30 bucks or something that I can go up and get myself some food. I'd appreciate it. And father could tell that this man was on something. Uh, and he just said, look, uh, I'm not going to give you any money, but there is a Burger King right up the road. I'll take you there and you can, you can get whatever you want, whatever you want. And the man said, no, 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 no. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. Uh, just give me, I'll just take the money. Father just said, no, uh, either you take my offer to take you to Burger King or you get nothing. And I said, okay, father, what did he do? He said, well, I took him to Burger King, but he, you could tell he didn't really like it. And there are people out there who are looking to get money, to get drugs, to get whatever. And it's a sad thing. It was another time a man asked for money and they, they needed gas. I need gas money. He said, he walked over here. And it's like, well, it's like, I will, I will you know, take you to the gas station. We can put in the gas in here and we'll fill it up. No, you don't have to do that. He says, well, either I do that or I'm not helping you at all. And I guarantee it's because Father Bernard, you know, was um, taken advantage of at other times that he became shrewd. You know, you would like to be like St. Francis and whoever came to ask, you just help them. And unless there are some serious tells that, that you really have should nothing to do with this person, you know, you do whatever you can. You don't want to go overboard, but you do what you can. And I learned that from Father Bernard. Well, and I think even St. Francis bring you with us today, he'd also probably impart similar wisdom because you're not necessarily helping someone by giving them exactly what they want. It's not because what mm -hmm. they want isn't always what they need. And yeah. um, and you learn that, especially if people are consistently coming back. It's like, how is my giving you money every time actually really helping you? Yeah. And I and I know I know that all the curves you have tried to go above and beyond, especially people that have come back, like to really help better their lives. And it's still yeah. uh, so it's, and it, it's a delicate balance, but that's not yeah, what it is. About. <laughs> it is. Yeah, well, it is a delicate balance, but Father Bernard was about charity, and his charity extended so much to the people and, and what he was willing to do. Father Bernard was on the, was on the road all the time, especially when uh started going up to Radisson and then eventually taking over the facility. Just the commitment, having to go up there and come back. And there was a time when, when you had Father Joseph there, that father would, Father Bernard or Father Joseph, depending on what week, would drive up on a Friday, like after school, and be there for the weekend and come back uh, Monday or Sunday night. And, uh, you know, that, ha that was that way for years until, you know, Father Joseph went down to Lubbock and Father Bernard uh had a new administrator and then they had to rearrange the schedule where they left right after church on Sunday to get there because they had to do payroll. They had to do the administrator had to look over things and and beginning of the week. So 
it changed the schedule and it was what a schedule to have uh, when you, you get up it, it, i this is how i describe father burner's schedule and it was we say this is pretty much consistent from about 2002 to about two, to 2020 that we'll start off father burner getting back from radisson he <laughs> he'd get back from radisson uh, and it depended what day on wednesday usually it was a wednesday always exceptions uh sometimes they would get back about five, six o'clock in the evening. Matt, Matt, this is a five and a half to six hour drive. Mm-hmm. I just did that drive yesterday. And father, or they would get back 11 o'clock at night, one or two in the morning, because Father Bernard did the work out there. He cut the grass. He did a lot of maintenance stuff there. And people would say, well, why didn't he just get someone to cut the grass? <laughs> that was Father Burner's recreation. He enjoyed doing it. And it was just kind of a, it was actually, he found it rather relaxing mm-hmm. and meditative to do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it, depending upon the weather, you know, of course, this is the summer or fall or whatever, when you would have to cut grass or late spring. And um, Father would, uh, Maybe because there was rain, he might have to cut on Wednesday. So it might not get done till like seven o'clock at night. And then you uh, hop on, you know, and you hop in the car around eight and makes for a long night. Uh, so then you have that, you get back somewhat, whatever time, Thursday, father was there paying bills, work, getting his bulletin put together, mailing out bulletins. Uh, he would have, uh, novena. We had Mother Perpetual Help Novena on Thursday nights. And then Friday morning, he did his communion calls. And there was a while he had like five or six people. And we're not talking about down the road or a few miles away. We're talking about people like all the way in uh, uh, the southern part of the state, some people in northern Illinois. And, and he would, at Friday, he would you know do that round. And not to forget, um, also probably sometime in 2013, perhaps, uh, you know, but prior to that, he was also going to Ohio and Michigan. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. Now, <laughs> so, was he doing that once a month? I think so. I think he was doing that once a month. Mm-hmm. So that would mean that he would get back on like a Wednesday. He'd have Thursday. Uh, or is he, or did he leave on? Yeah, he would leave on yeah. Friday, early Friday morning, or was it Thursday morning? I can't remember. I feel like a, he went more in the middle of the week. I, I feel like he probably adjusted his Radisson schedule to accommodate for that. No, well, when I I went with him before, and it was well, I mean, it maybe is adjusted over the years, and he just had to kind of work it. But when I went, it was we did the communion calls going south, mm-hmm. and then we drove to. Ohio had mass spend the night and then drove drove up to Michigan mm-hmm. and then drove back and that and he was doing that once a month and he'd do that for how many years I, I don't even know about it <laughs> at least a decade I think at least a decade he was doing that trip and so you have that so that sometimes changes it but his like his normal regular week then Friday, he'd get back. And then he's doing just more work. And Saturday was like whatever uh, like sort of grounds work that needed to be done. Or if he had to do it, he would do it. So you see him in his work clothes, cutting grass, doing whatever. Yeah, you had people who were able to help, but not all the time could they do it. So well, you had some young men who were like consistently mowing the lawn and stuff, but you know, father would be out there doing something else or working on this. And then Sunday says mass in the morning and does, you know, stuff with the catechism classes, then heads up to Radisson, heads up. And just like, it was like that every week. Obviously there have been exceptions having to make special trips for events and such, but generally speaking, 
that was Father Bernard's schedule. And well, when you got up to Radisson, and you know, there was a while that they were doing everything, he's paying, uh, doing their taxes, paying the bills and everything old school before they even used a computer. So that was that would take them pretty much an entire day to do, mm-hmm. which later on only took them a few a few like hours uh, with the computer. But you know, they go shopping in Monday on Monday, and then they start working all this. Oh, paying paying bills and uh, uh, paying the workers. It was just like consistent. Father Bernard would be going, and it's just unless he were he would bedridden, he'd be out there. I mean, there are people he would tell me stories. He'd have this cold, and he'd lay down for a little bit and get up, and he'd just work through it. And that's like one of the things like I learned from Father Bernard as a kid. I remember that, and I just remember one time we were setting up the downstairs room at church, the big blue room, we called it, because it was blue, <laughs> and we were setting it up for a funeral because it was a little hard getting that, uh, getting that uh, coffin up those stairs. Right, especially with the way the, the flight of stairs and the sharp turn. And- yeah, and a sharp turn. I know we've done it, but it's been really hard, and... Uh, I was like, I was like, I'd say, make sure there are no viewings after this. Uh, <laughs> but um, we would do it in that room, and I just remember at it, we sometimes would be in, in a on a school day, so it'd be like you know we'd attend the funeral, and then we'd not have classes, so we'd have to set the whole room up. We would have to uh, um, move things around. I just remember one time being just not feeling well. And I said, Father Bernard, I don't feel well. And he's just kind of like, you know, some, he's like, just keep working. Sometimes you feel better if you just get yourself moving and doing things. And I did. And I just remember going to Father and I said, hey, Father, you were right. I feel a lot better. And it's just being a kid. I think it was also a bit of laziness. I just didn't want to do the work. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I was like, okay, my stomach was bothering me, but I worked through it. And you, and you learn that from Father Bernard. You know, you you work through some things. Some things you you, you can't. Sure. We, we know you, you got to be prudent. Be but you also don't want to pamper yourself and you don't want to make excuses. So you learn that from Father Bernard. And, and it's just the dedication that yeah, Father was, Bernard had. He was very disciplined. Um, but I also think that goes back to because it's, you would read in the trip of Father Joseph wrote, he spent some time in the National Guard. He's also very athletic, too. Mm-hmm. He was a catcher for um, playing baseball. And actually, both Father Joseph and Father Bernard are, were very athletic. And that also had its advantages, too, um, for school. And um, although I was just telling someone recently, I, the really most I remember of gym class, especially middle school, consisted of playing dodgeball with Father Joseph having the ball. Um, he could throw um yeah he'd take it down he would he would um and he loved it we you know the thing is where we enjoy the attention like we're because we were also like how can we outsmart father oh he won't get us yeah um but one of one of my fondest memories is and i know we talk about it like not like on the podcast but you know i've talked about it and i think some of our peers too in those earlier days Mm-hmm. our church picnics and we'd have them in different spots and i remember one year in particular because you know we we meet up at a park sometime in the afternoon and i think this was know. at bishop bishop's woods i thought it was muskego park oh it might have been muskego because we okay. did go to muskego park for quite a few times which was really nice yeah. area yeah. um and we would get into playing volleyball Mm-hmm. And there was one year, and it had been not long before Father Joseph left, because I feel like I was old enough, like a teenager. Yeah. And one team had Father Joseph, and one team had Father Bernard, and they were playing to win. Mm-hmm. And they, I mean, they dove for it. I mean, it was so fun to see him in that way. Um, I mean, I'm sure whoever's team I was on, I disappointed very much so. But come on, get in there, hit the ground. I don't know. I was, I wasn't that motivated of a player Um, but um those are wonderful memories uh Mm -hmm. i know like i know we've kind of gotten away from those pitness maybe this will be anyone listening will be motivated let's let's try that again and you know 
pick a different park, you know, just yep. to make it interesting. Um, because those things really played a huge part in just that community feel of yeah. being able. You because know, in our situation, everybody's pretty separate as far as where they live. You know, you, mm-hmm. your 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 neighbor in your pew is not your neighbor in your home. Like not no work. I mean, obviously we're all neighbors, but you know what I mean. Like not even like exactly, a ten, yeah. not even within like a ten mile distance. For a lot of people, it's thirty miles. You know, yeah. thirty minutes. You know, there there's quite a distance between everyone here and. Um, trying to get together and i think that's probably why there was a lot of emphasis in those early years to do these picnics because that Mm -hmm. hasn't changed there are people that we've been scattered since the beginning yeah and that's why you need those moments and i just look back like i went even i went trade it even when we used to have the friday after thanksgiving church cleanup i remember when i I was ready to be like the first one to have my name on there because it was just exciting to be there and to be a part of something, um, sure, you had to work and maybe I wasn't like the best at it, but I just, it was something to want to be a part of. So, uh, but anyway, it just kind of goes to fathers. Um, it's like sometimes like, where did he get the energy? But probably also his, uh, um, I mean, he's Sicilian, so he's probably very, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but he took care of himself. I mean. Although, I mean, I know he had a sweet tooth, so you kind of wonder, but we talked, yeah. he, he just must have had a really good metabolism. Um, oh, my gosh. Because- you, know, I, I, you know, onto that, I, I remember having a conversation with him just a few years ago. And it was the thing is, is I was gaining weight because gain I, I've gained, I lay and I lose. I just, I just you know, can't keep it off. And we're talking about, well, I just like, I put on so much weight since I've been back here. And he's like, I know what you mean. I put on weight too. I was like, oh, really, Father? He says, yeah. You know, when I first arrived in Milwaukee, I was a, a hundred and fifty three pounds. Like, oh, okay, Father, yeah. And you know, and, and you know, and I checked my weight, and then I'm a, I'm hundred and fifty six. I said, Father, so basically, you gained a pound a decade. In thirty years, you gained basically a pound a decade. I was like, Father. And he starts laughing. I'm like, come on, father, this is not the same. Don't any just a pound a decade. I know it's hilarious. I just remember watching him um after mass on Sundays in the kitchen, getting ready to go up to mm-hmm. Radisson. And he'd have his cup and like his cappuccino powder mix, his mm-hmm. milk. Then he drop an egg in there and mix it up uh-huh. and drink it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like and, and he did that because Bishop Lewis uh, told him to do that, the egg, and, and he kept it up. He kept it up pretty much until he wasn't unable to drink it anymore. I mean, I will say I have added a egg yolk to a smoothie. Mm-hmm. but And I mean, I've seen Bishop Giles take a couple eggs in a, in a mug of salt and pepper and just slam it down. So that's well, just- I, I, I have, uh, I've done it. I have done the raw egg thing, and I was good for a while. But this was back in 2011. I was doing it. Now, I don't, and I was doing what Father Bernard was doing because so, another way he did it, he would put the egg, like two or three eggs in there, and then he would mix that up and put, put up chocolate milk. So I was doing, I had a thing of chocolate milk. I had my eggs and I would mix it up. Sometimes at work, I just did time for breakfast. So I'd mix that up and drink it. I go to work. I was working at Quad Graphics, and I just and I felt fine. I was drinking my water. I felt good. I had a little rumbly in my tummy, and I just I just go to the uh, I just go to my my uh, operator, and I just hey, I gotta just use the bathroom, sure. And I'm like okay, and I <laughs> remember coming out pale and just like like uh, like what happened to you? I was like uh I don't know. And I was running back and forth in there. That's and I, I, I had I had salmonella poisoning. Hmm. I did not know that one. So that was kind of coming, you know, you know, come. Uh, well, and I will say like when we. Blood we, coming we, out of places that normally don't come out. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for that, Father. But as far what? as like for us, we have our own, we have our own eggs. So there is, there is something to like knowing where your eggs are coming from if you're going to do it. But um the egg white is too slimy for me so i would never you can't even to me you can't even blend that up to make it not 
not no, not noticeable. Yeah. But anyway. But that was Father Bernard did. I, I, I asked him if he had any trouble with that. He said no. So I guess. Iron so stomach. My, yeah, I guess it was just my milk or my eggs or both. Maybe, yeah, but. But Father Bernard was of strong stock. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, was. he really was because, and I know we've talked about this over the years, how he actually looked pretty, he always looked younger than what he actually was. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. there was a picture on the tribute, and it's from 1996, but it's a picture with Sister Antina, Father Bernard, Father Joseph, and one of the gentlemen, actually, he's from New York and came to visit, um, and I'm guessing his wife took the picture, but Father Bernard looks very young in that picture, um, mm -hmm. and he was probably, I don't know how old it was, in 96, I can't do the math right now, but get the calculator, um, like our age, maybe a little bit older. Well, he had it. He would have been a little bit older. He would in his fifties, at least. At least in his fifties. Yeah, he would have been well, somewhere in his fifties. He was born in. He was born in uh nineteen thirty nine. Nineteen thirty nine. He was fifty seven, almost fifty. Well, almost fifty seven, probably. That's was, but you went to you. Wow. You look at that picture. Wow. Wow. He he. He could have passed for 40. Either yeah, um, easy. Even, even um, up until the time he died. I mean, really, mm -hmm. when, he, when he started to decline health-wise and his neck collapsed and all of that, that did age him. But up until that point, you wouldn't have guessed the man was embarking no, 80. No, no even, even what, what, when he would be repositioned and... and 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 you could see his face. He still didn't look that old. He did not look like he was like nearing eighty five. Mm -hmm. He did not look it. I actually have kind of a funny encounter with uh, the um, mechanic we have just down the road, who Father Bernard got to know well over the years. And I went and let him know that Father Bernard passed away. And he's like, "Well, thank you for letting me know." And he's like, "Wow." And just think about Father Bernard with that neck condition. I guess we'll kind of touch upon that a little bit. But it just basically his neck gave out and it was a condition he dealt with for about six years. And <laughs> I just go to the go to uh, the mechanic and we're talking. And he's like, Yo, yeah, I was like horrible what Father Bernard had to go through. And like and especially how young he was. I like, figured like he's like my age. I said, Pat, how old are you? He's like, God, 65. I'm like, father was like 84. What? It's no way. So there are a lot of people. I mean, I heard so many people say, no way he's that old. Father Bernard looked really good for his age. He did. And the thing is, he had a, a, a mischievous, you know, he had a good sense of humor. I mean, he definitely could be stern, like firm, but kind. Yeah. Kind of oh, like yeah. a... Fraulein Maria and Sunday. I think it was a good balance. He, he really was a really good he, balance of that. He was pretty control of his temper. And basically, if you pushed him too far, he let you know. And mm -hmm. you disappointed him, you really felt it. So he did. Oh man. I just he really felt bad about disappointing, but he but he was so forgiving. Mm -hmm. He was so forgiving. And and you know, I was thinking, how you talk about people and their aging and and there've been things about holy people and saints that they would keep their youth because of virtue. I I'm not I'm not trying to say anything necessarily my canonizing father. I'm just saying could have been because he was striving for that perfection, that conformity to God's holy will. The the evangelical councils and holding to them as strongly as he did. Is that what helped preserve him? So I I I, I wouldn't be surprised. It has something to do with it, and just yeah, he was uh, father was was really was really something uh, uh, when it just came to that. Oh, like a medical marvel to some people, and uh, but even in those later years, as you said, he didn't look as old. And but when the thing happened with his neck, his neck gave out and. He still tried. And that was another thing about Father Bernard. And you get frustrated with him. You're like, Father, stop trying to do this. Stop doing this. But he wanted to still contribute. He wanted to still say mass. He wanted to still do what he needed to do. This to him was not like, okay, now I got to step back and retire and, I, and, and quit and spend the rest of my life in a chair. He's like, no, 
is like, I'm going to keep going until God makes it clear I can't go anymore. And you only know that if you try. And Father Bernard tried. When his neck went out, he still wanted to see, can I drive a car? We positioned him, propped his neck up, wasn't working. We tried to get, we get we're looking for gizmos from, uh, um, uh, it slipped in my mind with kind of doctors, orthopedic doctors and such, you know, the he hold his neck up. The only thing that probably could have done it without his getting the surgery, which he eventually did get, would have been this whole device that would have been strapped to his waist and it would have been, you know, like holding him up. It's just, it would have been an odd thing for him to wear. Well, and he wouldn't so, be able to have and expensive. Blinds. And he wouldn't be able to check his blind spot. So it's yeah. just like, mm, not the uh, best. And so he tried. And then when he said, I can't, nope, can't do it. You know, and I uh, tried to mow the lawn still. And just till he's like, nope, can't do it. He knew. He just said, I, I have to keep trying. Even saying mm -hmm. mass. We, we had to figure out a system with Father Bernard and I that I was there with him. I basically was like saying two masses because I was saying my own mass and saying it with Father Bernard. And I mean, I served his mass and, you know, I'd help him with the pages. I would, you know, I think there were even a few cases where I had to pour the wine in the water for him and being a priest, I can do that according to the circumstances. Um, but most of the time he did it himself when receiving the, the chalice was the hardest part. So what we had to do is that he had to like bend over a bit where he could get the chalice in position and I would hold him and we put him up and we got pretty good at it. We, it was like, it was like, 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 like a beautiful dance near the end. Teamwork but, makes the dream work. Yeah. But there are sometimes father Bernard just had to do it himself and it just took him a lot longer. But he just, and that was that, that father Bernard even said to me, it's like, it's like, it's better to wear out than rust out. So until he just couldn't do it. And then even, even when he physically couldn't do stuff, he was still guiding people, hearing confessions, giving last rites. There was a case of one person that um, he got a call about up in, up in Radisson. And I was all the way down in Illinois. And he's asked me, he's like, father, you can get up here. And I was like, well, you know, could take me I'm not sure, hours. not sure if I can at the moment. I mean, I have to work my way. And Father Bernard was trying to arrange to be able to get out there, get someone to take him. And he was just ready to do it. He was ready to jump in. But if people want to know, I verified with the family and that it was just the person was not on their deathbed. It was a, they were able to wait until I arrived like the next day. They were able to wait so that it worked out. But when you're getting that call, you're not sure. And like I also learned from Father Bernard, you know, you call the hospital. You know, you don't, you, when you're told if someone's in the certain hospital, call them yourself so you can hear from the medical professional what condition the person's in. Do they need you to come out right away? Just practical things I learned from Father Bernard from his vast years of experience. And it had it been so hard for him especially having being up in Radisson, becoming a resident in Radisson to, to not be able to do things. And he said to me more than once, father, I'm sorry. I can't help you. I, I can't help you. I'm sorry, father. And I was like, father, you don't have to apologize. I know you, I know you want to, you, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh unfortunately is weak. It's crippled. So I understand, Father. I, I totally understand. And uh, and when we had to close the facility, there were a lot of concerns. A lot of things came up during that process. And uh, when we made the decision, we are going to close in the October of 2022. Tell you, it was a different. It felt hard telling Father Bernard that, but. We had no other choice. We had to do it um, for many reasons. One of them being that my schedule wouldn't allow me to give the time that Father Bernard did. And of all the concerns I had, 
which were a lot uh, for for that like nine months, was getting Father Bernard placed, making sure his insurance and everything and it, how he was all set. When I got Father Bernard placed in Sheboygan, which, you know, for reference to people, is about 50, 60 miles north of Milwaukee, and we're about 24 miles north. We're only about 30, 35 miles away from Sheboygan. So I was really happy, and I think so was Father. He was able to get there. And it was a nice place, a nice room he had, actually. Very nice. And uh, and the people, a lot of people, especially the the Mary, who was the administrator, um, who really has really got to know Father. Her she and her family live in Sheboygan, so they were able to see him like every day. They went on practically every day to visit father, to say a rosary. And, you know, the, you had elderly Catholics in these facilities who they see this priest and they want to come and say the rosary together with us. And uh, Father Berner got a reputation, um, even in that in Shores of Sheboygan is which what it's called. Just people loved him. People loved Father, and he's just such a kind man. I, I remember one man uh, out in East who who I speak with uh, quite frequently, never met Father Bernard. He's never actually met me in the flesh, but just would tell me. I talked to Father Bernard, and and he just he's a he's just a very humble man, and you can just get this aura even over the phone about him. That that you you're in the scent that you are in the presence of holiness. I was like, well, I mean, that's a quite a compliment. Don't tell Father Bernard that. Yeah. Father Bernard did not like anything. If anything took uh, about him took away people uh, in their relation with God, he he he. Well, and he'd be the first to correct you that it's it, it it's not me, it's God. Whatever you feel is like the Holy Ghost working with me, not. Anything of my own volition. Father Bernard was born December 25th, 1939. And it was, it was always kind of a joke. And like his birthday's Christmas. And I'd be like, you know, like Merry Christmas, Father, and happy birthday. You know, uh, well, blessed Christmas. He was, he was very, blessed, yeah, blessed Christmas. You can say both, but he was definitely more on blessed. blessed. He was a blessed type of man. And uh, yeah, so, so he would, he would never made a big deal about it being his birthday. Never did. And he never wanted to take away from Jesus Christ and the love we're supposed to have for him and celebrating that wonderful feast. Of course, I, I said, I remember saying to Father one time that I said, well, Father, I wanted to get you a Christmas present and a birthday present, which made him just kind of go, he he just, then, then he would show, he would have his poker face. So, hello, Father, hello. It's like, I wanted to get you a present. It's like not showing any emotion. And I say, I said, but father, what do you get the person who does who 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 doesn't want anything? How did I put it? How what do you get for the person who has everything and doesn't want anything? And he's like, nothing. I said, so that's what I got you, Father. Nothing except some prayers. He says, that's best. That's the best. And that really is. And I think that's something that I carried with me because, you know, especially when you're an adult and you have nieces or nephews and their birthdays come around Christmas, you, we all tend to overdo it. And then when, you know, they yeah. have multiple relatives, like it gets a little excessive. And our brother James yeah. had a good plan and um, it's just have masses said for them. Mm -hmm. or you know make a spiritual bouquet and let them know you're praying for them on their birthday like that mm -hmm. that has so much much better than any that's so like, important object. yeah it's so important and and to let people and if somebody understands their faith that's the, best thing. the idea that someone's praying for you it's huge i'm praying for you thank you and when father bernard said he's praying for you you knew he was actually praying for you and that's mm -hmm. what i learned from him you have people walking down the street who asked for our blessing, asked us to pray. And Father Bernard taught me. He said, look, 
if someone asks me to pray for them, when when they walk away, right away, as soon as I'm able, I stop and I say at least one Hail Mary. Yep. I don't want to forget that. And that and if that Hail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would. And he's like, you know, that one Hail Mary said with devotion and intention could be all the difference. It's like, okay, thank you, Father. And so you know, that was the type of impression and, and the type of man that people saw. And that's why these people in uh, the, the assisted living facility were so attracted to him. Um. But just I just go back to he just how he just wanted to help the souls. He was always wanted to keep doing that even to the end. And you know, you know, a man who was ready to be up all night to hear confessions, or be ready to go give last rites at at any call, any time of the day, he was willing and ready to do all these things. And it's just how hard it had to be, but. Father's role changed, and I think we would call Father now became the suffering soul. And see, was he suffering? Oh, yeah. Not just the fact he couldn't do anything, but his back and his neck were constantly br bringing him pain. And I, I, you know, he had to be on medication. It was getting that bad. It was, it was so bad at some points, like back in Radisson. We couldn't even touch him to help move him, get into bed. We had a lot of scares with Father Bernard thinking he was going to die. He was going to pass away because it was just getting worse and worse and worse. But he didn't, and that was a good. He made it to Sheboygan. He had a, a huge effect upon these people. I started saying mass there uh, once a month and I got to get back to it. I got to call them up and say, I'm still doing it. They might, I think they think I quit, stopped doing that because father burner died. And it's not the case. I've just been swamped this summer, these last few months. Mm -hmm. And hey, it's one of the reasons why I haven't done a podcast in about two months. Mm -hmm. so, oh, uh, but anyway, he had that effect on the people, on the workers and, and well, when Father Bernard started really declining, it was an interesting thing because we didn't, he looked like he was just going to be stable for a while. It needed to be something really huge. And I didn't necessarily think this was going to be it, but I got a call in the middle of the, about nine o'clock at night, one evening in June, Father Bernard requested to go to the emergency room. So I went to go take him and, uh, you know, he said, you know, I asked him if he needed me there. And he said, I don't need last rites. No, I, because I gave him last rites prior at another time. And he said, you know, he didn't need that. But then I, do you want me still there? And he's like, yes. Now, before, before, you know, I, I, I guess it really mentioned one of my old reasons also for going out and taking him, which was just down the street in this hospital. Was if was because the girl told me we're going to get like a non emergency ambulance to come and take him. I'm like, well, no, because unless some of the rules are a little different or changed, last I heard, you pay that out of pocket. And, I, and I'm not paying Father Bernard an $800 Father uh, wants trip to. over there. I say, like, no, I'll stay up. And I stayed up with him and he was admitted to the hospital. And he was just fluid was building up. And it was getting so bad, father kind of, he was out of it. We didn't know if it was medication or what, but he was out of it. And they took, they sent him to a hospice care because they, they were, he had like a week, a little week to live. Okay. But geez, father burner just kept on going. I mean, because he, because of that diagnosis, you no know, people were there you know, constantly. I mean, it was almost a time he was never alone. Oh, except over the night, but during the day, it was not alone, and people were visiting him. People were, you know, coming from different, different places, and the, still the same group saying the rosary with him. I set up an altar, the same mass for him. Uh, during during that time, I was thinking just remembering Saint Francis when he was ill. He had someone come and say mass for him. So let me do this for my brother in religion. 
And Father Bernard was out of it, but he knew enough that he was attending Mass. And he was able, he was signing himself. He was able to receive communion, or at first he couldn't because there was issues with the swallowing, but he was able to take a little bit of the host. I mean, he started to improve. There's this beautiful picture that's on the tribute of many of us surrounding Father while he was in the hospital room. And he's smiling at that little smile of his, and you know, he uh, he just, just started getting better, which is like, okay, what's our next move? It's like, well, you know, we sent him back. He went back to the original uh, place, the shores of Sheboygan. And um, he was, you know, he got back, you know, he started eating again, and things were looking good. It's like, okay. And only a few days after arriving, he just took a turn for the worse again. I went to go see him on a Tuesday, and uh, I didn't bring communion. I didn't know if he could receive, and it looked like he could. And I said, I'll come by Friday, Father, and give you communion. And he said, okay. And I had someone ask me just recently, what was Father Bernard's last word to you? Yeah, it was when I was up north. What was his last word to you? I said, okay. That was the last word Father Berner spoke to me. And uh, which is quite interesting because if you asked him, how are you doing, Father? It was either I'm okay or I'm as good as God wants me to be, which was usually a sign. Uh, usually it was a way of him saying, I'm in pain. I don't think he meant to convey that to people. But we under we eventually understood that's what he means. Uh, I go back Friday, and Father is just getting worse. He was just not responding. He was breathing still, but he just wasn't responding. And I think his eyes might have flickered open once or twice, but he wasn't really doing anything. And he started modeling and you know, so many things started negatively. So I said, well, I'm going to bring the altar back. I'm going to set it up in this room and we're going to have mass. And I had mass that Friday night. Um, and then I had to go away for that weekend. And they said he could go at any time. And I said, well, no, just let me know. I said, if he doesn't, I'll be back on Tuesday. I, like I said, I was out of town. I got back that Tuesday. It was the uh, 20, I've been the 23rd of June. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 23rd of June. And I got back. I went, I stopped off here for a little bit and I went up to Sheboygan and I had mass. Father Bernard was. July. Uh, I'm sorry. That's why I was coming. I was like, uh, July, not June. June. Yeah. July, July. And uh, I was got up there and I said mass and some people were able to attend. And, you know, just, just before that, I got a call from the hospice center and these were, I got to say, place was wonderful. The people at the assisted living facility were wonderful, but they just did such a one beautiful job for father's care. And they called and said, you know, we are offering a service. Nobody dies alone. So would you want someone to always be there with him. So he, he's not alone when he passes. That was a beautiful thing. And after talking with Bishop Giles, we determined we have enough people. We can, we can do this. We can do this. We know father is not going to last. We like this week, if he does, it's only because God does not want him to die. And, um, so we, uh, we arranged with some of the people who lived close by, and it was decided when I got back on that Tuesday, I was going to spend the night. So I brought my bedding. I brought everything I, I needed. Um, we had mass. After I had dinner with a few parishioners, I came back. And, um, you know, on that drive from I Illinois up there, I had a thought. I said, I think today's the day. I think Father's going to die sometime in the night. 
I never had that thought before. I was kind of like, maybe, maybe. This was the one I said, no, I think it, this is going to happen tonight. I just don't know. I don't know what it was, but I had that feeling. So, said prayers for the dead, for the dying. I mean, prayers for the dying. We had a little novena, not novena, but prayers for them. Said the office with him or for him. I said the rosary with him and, you know, just talk with him a little bit. Um, I read uh, scripture to him, especially the story of old man Simeon. Dismiss thy servant, O Lord, for I have seen the, sal the salvation. And he passed away that night. He passed away about 1.30 the next morning on the 24th. And uh, he wasn't confirmed dead until about an hour later. I stayed. I took apart the altar. I kept myself busy until the funeral home came by, and we then got... We got them all together, and um, I helped lift his body into the onto the gurney, and it was uh, most active I've ever been with a funeral um, or the death of someone. And uh, I just, you know, then the next few days was just planning it, getting him to to have it that following Saturday here in in uh, Wabaka, then having it the the next Wednesday. And uh, funeral home, Max A. Sass and Sons just worked wonderfully with us. You know, we have one of our parishioners works there, uh, so it was it worked beautifully in, in the funeral home that we had down in Linamans, down in uh, Kentucky. Um, they were they were great support as well because we flew Father's body down for the funeral, um, but before. The funeral in Wabaka, I went brought his habit. That's what he was buried in. And in doing all that, I uh I uh got to cut father's hair. I got to help prepare him uh a little bit. And uh it was it was I say it was an honor to do. It was an honor to do that for father. And I think for me, as far as emotionally, this was one of the the toughest deaths I've ever had to face of anyone. Because like I said, Father Bernard's been there, right? He's always been there. And just this loving man, his, his charity, his patience. And, and that's what I preached about in the sermon. Uh, I, I said, you know, what scripture, what scripture character would Father Bernard be like? You know, what, 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 who, 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 you know, who would he be? And I said, he would be the prodigal son's father. Because no matter how far you strayed from the faith, no matter, you know, what you did, Father Bernard was always there to welcome you back with that hug, metaphorically speaking, <laughs> and to do whatever he could to help get you back on track in your quest for God. And, and, and as Father Joseph said in his sermon, Father, jo Father Bernard was the kindest and gentlest charitable man he's ever known. And I think for a lot of people, that's what Father Bernard was. He was he was truly a father. He truly cared. And and the most notable thing he said to me in his last few weeks was, I love the parishioners. I love them. And the parishioners showed their love for Father why everything they did by coming to him and uh, just 
you know, one thing I didn't even mention when Father Bernard went to Sheboygan, he was he was at Mass here every Sunday, and it wasn't easy for him. But he loved the Mass. He wanted to even try to say Mass one more time. He was asking me, how can we make this work? Like, it's, it's, it's not going to happen, Father. But he had that desire. And he had that desire for that desire for the mass was the same as his desire for souls. And up till that, I, I know he was praying for everyone. He was praying that they would come to know Christ better. And that was Father Bernard. And this is why, especially the last few weeks, I have been looking at Bishop Lewis's coat of arms in a different light. Something that we you know you just recently got digitized and are able to now use it in, uh, more extensively. And I was like, you know, this this is this is almost like for our community, our our symbol as well, just for the community in general. Because Bishop Lewis has written there, Deus caritas est, God is love. And it's that love of God that moved a soul like Father Bernard to sacrifice so much of himself, to sacrifice his wealth, to sacrifice everything he did. Because Father Bernard was a well-to-do man. He had a whole life before he joined the, joined the priesthood, before he joined the Franciscan order. He was in his 40s. He gave it all up because God called him to something higher, to something greater. Whatever charity he could have done in the world would have shadowed in comparison to the charity and love that he performed for us during 30 plus years. Yes. I mean, and because uh, he was ordained in 1984, he actually... Um, celebrate his 40th anniversary on June 29th Um, because he was still you know while he couldn't say mass he was still as much as a priest as he was before and counsel as you said counseling people and Mm -hmm. um, I mean and when you think about how because he came to it later I mean still be 40 years and pretty much almost that entire 40 years fairly active is quite remarkable but again we talk about how he just really came from stronger stock <laughs> so <laughs> um but and i know we're, we're pretty much at a wrapping up point so i want to add that as wonderful and as charitable as father bernard was that i just ask all of our listeners to please keep him in your prayers for the repose of his soul we don't know where he is you know, he had many a good qualities, but I know people can even say that about us and us knowing ourselves, like, I don't deserve heaven. If I were to die right now, I I know I don't deserve heaven. And Father Bernard would chastise any of us if we were to say, oh, he's in heaven. He's in heaven. Um, we need to pray for him. And, you know, if he is in heaven already, those prayers will not be wasted. Uh, but, you know, it's just, just to remember him really until the day you die. Um, because think about the people he remembered and uh, whatever God will allow when he, when in, he can intercede for us. Um, so just so very important. I mean, I, I know it, it. we often want to think about our loved ones already being in heaven. But and I guess to some people that's, that's comforting. Mm-hmm. But that's not a re- to me. I don't know how it can be when it's not a reality because you're not doing your loved one any favors by by vocalizing or believing that they're already in heaven. Yeah, the no. that's not, that's not church teaching. So, um, is is so think if you think about it that way, you really just can't find any comfort in doing so. The greatest comfort is to just consistently pray for that soul. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, and we know yeah. that the poor souls remember us when they are released from pure purgatory. So again, just please remember Father in your prayers. And those words that are said 
and during a requiem mass, they're said during prayers for the dead, and, and it's just eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. May he rest in peace. And as what we pray for Father Bernard, may he rest in peace and praying for his soul. And he will be missed by all of us. But don't worry, Father, you won't be so missed that we're not we're gonna stop doing what we need to do, what you inspired us to do, what you taught us to do and what you prayed and worked so hard for in and in situations like this is now is shows is more and more the acceptable time for sal our salvation so thank you father bernard and we love you we still love you we pray for you and deo gracias <laughs>